We are ready. Mm-hmm. Good evening. My name is Lady Bev. I'm honoured to be interviewing Dr. Idika Imeri of Idika Imeri Ministry. This is part two of the interview. Good evening again, Dr. Idika. Good evening, Lady Beverly. Uh, how is it going on in England, in Birmingham? It's fantastic. Still fantastic, very still good. bright. Very good, very good, <laughs> yes. very good. Okay. I've got some more questions for you. Oh, yeah. All right. How many hours a week do you currently work? And what do you feel is a reasonable schedule? Um... I do put in a lot of hours. I presently I put in more than um, I put in more than um, uh, forty hours a week. Uh, there are weeks that I put in up to fifty hours or more, um, depending on the event or the occasion that is going on in the ministry. So I do put in a lot of hours. Uh, our office hours actually begin on Tuesday uh, from 9 a.m. to 5 uh, p.m. Central Standard Time as of now. I, I have to do that because there's just a lot that is demanded of me. So I do that. I do that right now. And also, I'm also doing my best to share responsibility to other, uh, uh, with other people. To help me in ministry, but you know, since this is just something that is growing and coming up, I have to pay the price for tomorrow. So that's why I put in a lot of hours. I put in a lot of hours for studies. I put in a lot of hours, especially on the phone praying with people. There are so many people in need all over the world that calls to our ministries, and um, they call our phone line three one six. Seven six five zero zero six zero, and um, either they go to the voicemail, but most of the time, if it is during the office hours, it is answered and they are prayed for and ministered to over the phone, over Skype, over FaceTime, etc. We we spend time to 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 read the mails that they send and pray over their prayer requests, and then I spend a lot of time doing what I call the ministry of direction or giving direction to people. Who, are, who need who need direction in life, marriage counseling, business, uh, to 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 coach and train people uh, who are part of the rich uh, one thousand plus club. So a lot of thing goes on here. Also, churches do consult with me in the area of mi of of mission work, and so on. And I give them advice and tell them, give them direction on how to go about things. Some people who are this is the first time for them to go on mission work they consult with me and i and i spend some time to coach them on on uh, cultural practices in those countries and what they should watch out for so that's what i do what is the most helpful thing you can tell us to truly understand the real you um the thing that I can say that will make people understand the real me, it will be one word, and that word is devotion. Devotion, stability, power. Those are the things that really describe who I am. High passion for what I do uh, with God and for the people of God. Those are the words that accurately describe the real me then family i love my family dearly um it's very, very important uh, god began to share with me in what i call key teachings he will give me a key that will unlock things for me one of them is that god's greatest wealth is people humanity and god's greatest weapon is family so these are the things that really, really speak very strongly about me. What roadblocks do you feel are currently holding you back 
in your ministry? Well, when once when once we relook at the ministry, I think the roadblocks will be all out. Um, there's nothing. There is not much roadblock as such. Um, as far as we have put things in place that we want to accomplish, we'll dream about it. Uh, we'll, we'll, we have uh, we've talked about it. Uh, I think the roadblocks will all be out of it. The more we seek the face of God and be in the presence of God, whatever was holding me back many years ago from entering into my real ministry and doing what they all they, 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 they vanish and they have been vanishing. And so I've seen opportunities and open doors, etc., happening to me. And I'm going to see a lot. I believe that I am more, and I'm going to see more, more blessing in the area of people coming to Jesus Christ around the world, more of people being um, baptized in the Holy Ghost, more of people being delivered from demonic oppression, from the powers and practices of idol worship, witchcraft, ancestral, and ancestral craziness. I'm going to see more of evangelization and mission work in my lifetime and lay solid foundation for it for many years to come. I, I believe very strongly that I'm going to see a lot of investments in different areas of business uh, in my lifetime and in my ministry. I, am also, I also know that God is going to pour out mighty riches, wealth upon this ministry and upon those who covenant with this ministry. That's the way I see it and I see it about to explode and about to happen. I also see a mighty outburst of the presence of God upon the earth, of God wanting us to dominate the earth and have mastery over it in the area of our professionalism and expertise. Have you come to a place in your life where you're no longer searching for answers to fundamental doctrinal questions? Yes, I have reached that place where there is a center for everything and a center for the gospel, and that is Christ himself. And the secret of success on earth is communion and relationship with God the Father. And the secret of function and devotion on earth has to do with entering into that place with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. Uh, I do not, doctrine doesn't bother me anymore. And um, asking questions, I only ask questions that are relevant so that I can get relevant answers to solve problems. So doctrines do not bother me. Creeds and tradition do not bother me anymore. I've crossed, I've crossed all those boundaries. I've broken all those fences. And I'm able to see things for what they really are. Have you ever read through the entire Bible? Absolutely, I have read through the entire Bible many times. And each time that I read a word from the Bible, I believe that any word from the Bible is capable of raising the dead. I believe very strongly that the Bible is the only book relevant enough, authentic enough for anybody to take very serious and to believe what it says. I believe that I can take one word from the Bible and do many things. So sometimes when I look at Christians, they don't even know what they are having in their hand. They think it's just a mere literature. It's not a mere literature. The Bible is a dynamic power omnipotent power of God in the hand of anyone who holds it. And the, and the quicker we know this, and we enter into this place where we begin to take the word of God just as it is, and begin to apply it just as it is, it will begin to work for us. I mean, there are things here and there that we need a little tweak and there to make sense of it. But majority of what is in the Bible should be allowed to be intact, to parade the way it is. For either God has spoken to the Bible or he is not. For me, he has. And for me, he's, he's currently still speaking. The Bible is the voice of Jesus. It is the voice of the Holy Spirit. It is the voice of the Father. So for me, it's not just a sacred book. 
is my tool book, my workbook for life. Are you able to think critically without being critical? Let me say this. I read that place with God and in ministry and in experience that what people say doesn't bother me, cannot tear me apart. I've gone through it. I've gone through crisis and things in my life as a, as, as a teenager, as a young adult and so on. So, so they made me tough. I see every crisis and criticism as an opportunity. In fact, I welcome every criticism that will help me be more and make this ministry be more. So criticism are very good. Those who cannot accept criticism, who cannot accept corrections and obey a command, I don't think they are meant for this kind of business. Are you a natural encourager to your members? Well, uh, there is a prophet, uh, a man of God somewhere, that called me one time and he said this. He said, people, are, uh, rally, uh, people rally around you so easily. How do you do it? You see, when God dwells in you richly, it flows automatically. There is a magnetic field in life. People become attracted to God through me so easily. People share with me so easily. And I do not take those things lightly. It's a privilege that God has given to me to be his son. And a privilege that Christ has given to me to be his student, his disciple, and to be part of his ministry in my generation. So... These are not things that I joke with. Do you enjoy a wide network of friends, professionals, associates outside of your church family? Oh, it would have been sad if I do not have people outside my church family, religion and so on. Uh, people who think differently from me because they, they, they are bringing into my life what I do not have. So I enjoy a wide variety of friends, people from diverse cultures. Uh, sometimes because people say, okay, this guy is from Africa, automatically maybe may the people who will follow his ministry and churches are African. But that is not true. Majority of people who follow, who follow what God is doing through me are people from every nationality, every geographical inclination, political ideologies, you know, Caucasians. Asians, people from West Indies, a whole lot, lots of Caucasian people, African Americans, Africans. So I find that a privilege. It is sweet. I enjoy it because they are bringing different things into the same pot of soup, and this is this is awesome. How do you handle defeat? Well. For me, there is, there is no defeat. There is opportunity. So what looks like defeat in those days will make me begin to complain and whine and, and sit back and be moody and all kind of stuff. It died naturally in me when I realized that I am called to be a champion. I'm called to be a leader, a ruler. A leader that knows how to lead, a, a leader that knows how to rule and a ruler that, that knows how to lead. When I discovered that I was called to be a champion and a hero in Christ, I began to see anything that might appear to be like a defeat as a sign of God talking to me, a sign of me doing something different. Are there personal discipline issues in your life that you have struggled to overcome? Um... Yeah, like I love chocolate. I love chocolate. I drink a lot of tea. I love that. Who doesn't? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> another, another, let me put it this way to you. An outside joke. Um, I am a very strongly one, um, um, passionately focused person. 
Like if I am doing one thing, for example, if I am praying for people, and let's say 10 people call me today, I will have that tendency of warning to minister to the whole, to the entire 10 people. Instead of breaking it down till another day, because I'll be afraid that if I allow, the call will begin to pile up a whole lot. But I know that in the next few months, I will have other people who will be sharing these things with me. So it will not just be I alone that is praying for people and ministering to there will be other people associate that have been raised. I am training quietly an uh, associate who will be rising up to the task also. So these are the things that I'm doing. Sometimes I find this as a discipline issue. Sometimes I get into prayer and I will have to, um, I will pray, I will just enjoy it and just go on and on and on and on. So I want a situation that, and that is what I'm struggling with, ability to do this and ability to do that and ability to do this and ability to do this and that. But when various departments arise within the ministry, then this will all become easy for me. Can you give some examples of how you relate or don't relate to unsaved people? My family back in Africa, especially my wider family, I mean, among my mom, siblings, and so on, and my, and my father, Aguime Ribe, of blessed memory, we are all born again, spirit filled, in quote. But I also have uncles, nephews, cousins. I also have aunties who are not yet born again. They don't want to have anything to do with the church. They love me so dearly. I am their, da their darling idol. I'm their darling son. They love me. They love me. They are crazy about me. But the point, they are not Christians. And I love them and crazy about them. So I, I pray to God that before God calls each of them home, they will have opportunity of, of, of becoming born again, spirit filled. Because I don't want to lose any of them anymore to hell. But I enjoy, I enjoy them. Um, also, the Muslim community, the Buddhist community, Hindus, Baha'i, Jehovah Witnesses, people in the lodges and so on, who are attracted to me for, I don't know, or attracted to my teachings and so on. But they don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. And I'm praying for them quietly without telling them that I'm doing that. Maybe that's what is attracting them. And uh, in many ways, true, sometimes it's not even what I say. It is my devotion, my friendship with them, solving their problems. And then they become Christians. And then they tell me afterward that they become Christian through their relationship with me. Now I've seen that happen many, many times. So I can't stop being friends to these people because they are part of this earth. Describe how you would minister to a homosexual in truth and in love. Well, I will say this. I will never wait homosexual couple in my church and ministry. I will never do that. I'll refer them to go to other churches where that is done. The reason is because I believe very strongly that the, that the concept of marriage is a very qualitative relationship between a man and a woman. When God created them, he created them male and female. So I, I, I reserve to be respected, to be honored for keeping the tradition, the biological, anthropological, and cultural tradition of God. I, I, I deserve to be heard and to be listened to in that aspect. Well, but the point is, if homosexuals are part of my ministry, as some of them are, or church, I love them, I care about them. They are crazy about me, I love, love them, love what they do, their job and everything. But when it comes to waiting, joining a man to a man or a woman to a woman, I will not do that. Do I love them? Will they be part of what I do? Yeah, sure. Will I honor? I don't know that's going to work out, how that's going to work out in the future between me and this community. But for them to be given their rights and privileges, they're entitled to it. They, they're entitled to be heard. This is a long-going, um, this is it's a, it's a very hard place. 
it's a hard it's one of the hardest thing for me is the concept of a man being with another man and a woman being is one of the hardest thing because I don't I cannot even I don't even know how to go to those play those those dynamics with them or what it even means I don't know but my decision is to love them genuinely open the doors of our ministry to them and um, and 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 let them love God and seek God I'm still seeking God to give me an answer as to how I should respond to this community as of now. Should they be given their rights and privileges in the world? Yes, they should. But I keep wondering if, if a man want to be a friend to another man, should it be called a marriage? Uh, what about if somebody should rise up tomorrow and say, well, I have decided to be married to my dog or to my cow or to my camel or donkey or cat? Should we give them that privilege too? So there are things that are happening that I don't get. I do not understand. It's almost like saying, instead of saying gun security in America, we are talking about the Second Amendment right. It's simply a matter of common sense of protecting us from us. Human is human. We are prone to make some silly mistakes if we are not watched. If there, are, if there are no fence around us. Should somebody go and buy and carry some big guns around the street as though we live in some world in which there are no laws? I don't think so. So these are issues for me. These are issues that are really sometimes frustrating. They are issues that sometimes demand a lot of prayer from me. Do I hate them? God forbid. Because I have so many of them in Utah, in other places, California, San Francisco, people who call me and we talk, I mean, as though nothing is there between them and myself. But when they raise this issue, it breaks my heart to know that I hold to a strong ideology, biblical ideology of just man and woman. And there is a different thing entirely. So sometimes I just wish that we don't go to that place of discussing that aspect of their lives because outside that I mean everything is great what do you do for growth in your spiritual and devotional life uh, what I do for growth um, I use a lot of um, calm music uh, not necessarily gospel music because I break all the bounds I am not tied down to a tradition Never will I be. Um, I use the Bible mainly as the prayer book of Edekai Mary. I, I, for example, I read a word or a phrase or a sentence. It captivates me. It speaks to me. The Bible has a voice. And I spend, I, 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 might, I can spend my entire day on just a word or a phrase or a, or, or, or a vase or passage of scripture. And uh, it really boils within me. And push out of me things that has been there or deliver the package to me. So the Bible is primarily my my book of prayer. Um I use the hymns. One of the most important music that I enjoy for devotion and for my spiritual growth is charms, like from the Psalms. From the Psalms. And uh, I really, really enjoy it. I enjoy the Psalms. I enjoy I enjoy the Bible generally. So I can open to any way in the Bible and have my devotion very, very strongly. Uh, sometimes it's systematic, sometimes it's not. So that is what, that is what uh, I do. I also find time to have a quiet retreat, to get out for a week or so or two and seek God. And uh, sometimes I see God coming to seek me. Uh, and and that, has been, that has been the whole... I, I do things... I, I, I like calm environment. Also, noisy environment doesn't even stop me from, from my spirituality. So, two, two instruments I really enjoy are the harps and saxophone. I, I, love, I love the wind, the wind uh, instruments. They are very, very calm. They take me to the throne of God. But most of the time, I produce my own song when I'm, when I'm meditating or praying. I also, I, I also read the works 
classic works of Christianity, like Jonathan Edwards. I also, I also watch or listen or read the works of great men of God like Derek Prince and, um, and uh, Kenneth Hagen Sr., etc., uh, Catherine Cohn, all those people, Smith Wigglesworth, I, I go to them to, to glean from them the secret of the presence of God, of power, and of success in their ministries. So, so I do those things. I do those things. I use them. And then also the hymns of people like John and Charles Wesley, etc. I, I use the, the church hymns are very, very helpful for my spiritual growth. What excites you and what makes you extremely happy in your ministry? Wow, what really excites me is when I'm praying and the presence of God comes down upon me and feel we am praying. Normally oh. it comes with extreme joy. Joy is not just a virtue, it is a thing. It's a personality that comes. The Holy Spirit pours all this from himself into me. It's almost like sugar and wine and oil mingled together. It's, it's, it's exciting. That's number one. But when I go fishing, I love fishing. I love fishing. It excites me. When I am with horses or riding horses, and when I'm gardening, I love to do gardening, whether flowers or food, or food crops. It's, a, it's really exciting. Music excites me. Good books, especially great biographies of great people, excites me. You know, this, this are, these are the things that really, really excite me. The Bible excites me. I'm crazy about that book. The presence of Jesus excites me. And also, when I am in the presence of nice people, you know, People who can think. When I listen to a thinker talking, sharing, that excites me a lot. So th these are some of the things that excites me in life. What do you enjoy doing in your spare time? Uh, you did my... say a bit of thinking earlier. Yeah. Is there anything else? Yeah, well, um, I, like I said, in my spare time, I like to write, I like to read. I like to listen to music. I also enjoy gardening, fishing. I, 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 I love traveling. Um, I love being around my family and being with my family. I, 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 I enjoy being around my friends and the cleaning, gleaning and tapping into what I call the idea bank. That is tapping into the knowledge and different um, uh, 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 fields and faculties and departments of expertise of friends who bring that divergent knowledge into operation at a particular moment. That, that's really, really interesting. And also, I enjoy, I enjoy eating healthy food. Do you have any hobbies? Well, my hobbies are actually gardening, fishing, traveling, reading, writing. Um, I like going out on a walking trail. I, I like that. I like going out uh, to visit Mother Nature. I like doing that. It's, it's very, very important to me. Those are my hobbies. Yeah. I like going out to like look at nature. yeah. I like going out to look at new houses, the pattern, the way they are built. I like to look at old old houses in books or in movies to see the way to see the way that they they, they were built. I like classic movies, ancient movies, or Byzantine, Roman, uh, etc. I love it. So these are some of the hobbies that I have. My hobbies: I love to read biographies. Um, then I like to shop. I love shopping. Come on now. I like to shop for... Oh, yeah, I like to shop for new suits, new colognes, new shoes. Um, and, then I, and then I will give the other ones in the closet away and get something nice. I like nice things. I believe God wants me to have nice things and to live good. I, I like luxury. Yeah. 
I like luxury. Because I realize that Jesus is so wealthy. So why should I be poor? Okay. What kind of continuing educational opportunities have you found most meaningful? Well, I did, um, I did clinical chaplaincy many years back. I also took some, some, uh, some courses with the United States Institute of Peace. Um, I also, I also um, um, continually um, I'm reading theological journals, um, biblical journals, um, uh, uh, Nature Magazine, National Geographic. I, I try to do what I call Ivy Laning or General Laning. I open myself to what is happening in science and technology, but in my field, which is mainly spirituality and business and leadership um, and power, I go back to, uh, to study the, the, the classic writings of the church, beginning with the church fathers. I go back there. I remember Eva Gruss of Pontius who says that a theologian is someone who prays. He didn't say that a theologian is somebody whose head is full of books, but whose heart is empty. So I, I am what we will call a balance between the order of the, of the, of the school men and the order of the spiritual men. So in me, there is, a, there is a balance of the intellectual and the spiritual. So I, I, I read a whole, I have just finished reading the entire works of Plato, all the works of Plato, all the works of Aristotle. Then I've finished the works of Augustine, Thomas Aquinas recently. Then I started going through David Hume, all the ancient philosoph uh, ancient philosophy, medieval philosophy, modern philosophy, uh, uh, philosophy and philosophers. So I go back and I read so as to know how human think, you know. So philosophy is not just love of wisdom. Philosophy actually is love of knowledge, inquiry into knowledge. That's, that's the way I look at it. <laughs> yeah, and a love of knowledge. So I go into this. I go back to read what Martin Luther, John Knox, Jonathan Edwards, uh, John Bunyan, all these people, what they wrote, George Whitfield. I have gone back to read their works recently and see what they are saying about different topics and glean from them. These are the things that I am doing. Right now I'm watching all the, the films, all the, the, the documentaries that I can find on Catherine Coleman and Derek Prince. Uh, but God actually shared with me that the one single person that I showed really spent time to learn about his ministry is Kenneth Hagen Sr. That my ministry is going to be like his. So I learn how he does ministries. When he shut up and let other people minister, and when he calmed the storm, how he, how, how he entered into that place with God. So I am learning and I'm, I'm, I'm reading. That is my continuous education. I am also reading the works of other great theologians, how they approach God, how they do the business of God through the intellectual arena, and so on and so forth. Can you give an example of how you've dealt with conflicting points of view? I deal with conflicting point of view by reading both sides and trying to bring a balance to it. Can you share a specific story that has shaped your life and faith? Well, when I, was, when I was in high school, people like Al Hukun of Asaga, of um, All Saint Presbyterian Church, Emmanuel Kaluka, who was then in the, in the early 80s, was the pastor of All Saint. He's from Ututu, Ututu uh, in, uh, in, the, in eastern Nigeria. Um, and my, my namesake, 
my elder, Idika Kalezi, my mom, Mercy Agwime Ribe, and my father, Agwime Ribe, these people shaped my theology, which is purely devotional theology, not strictly intellectual, but devotional. Well, in the morning, we go for morning prayer, and then I watch the way they live their life. Also, from my father's side, Abia uh, Ohafia, people like uh, Miracle Ajas, um, that is uh, Miracle Aji, Bekal Ajas, um, he's a doctor now, um, who teaches at the Presbyterian Seminary back in Nigeria. His father and mother, and also elder, who were elders, and Elder Ndo, um, those were the three people in Abia Ohafia where my father is from and where we are from also who also shaped my 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 spirituality and it was all devotional so these are that's that's how my devotional life was shaped and then i become a member of scripture union it becomes shaped more further and i i was open to a, a strong awareness of the holy spirit and i began to get involved with assemblies of god pastors uh, deeper life church pastors past, uh, uh, and members from different Pentecostal backgrounds and that really opened me more to a wider circle of what God is doing and how things are done and so I was not limited to the Presbyterian church I became more open and then my involvement with Abigail Ukebu and and um, especially with her was also very very influential in in bring me in bring me uh, into where I am now. If you can only be remembered for one thing in your life, what would you like it to be? I would like I would like um, to be remembered for my love of God, my passion for humanity. Those are the two things that I would love to be remembered. Because these are the two things that influences everything that, that, uh, that I do. I have had several, several encounters with spiritual forces of good and evil. And I know these things are real. I have seen so many miracles. I have, I have prayed for people who are suffering from insanity and they become sound, their mind becomes sound. I have prayed for people who were looking for, who were barren, and they have children. I have picked young men and spoke wealth over them, and they've all become millionaires. I have spoke and blessed people who didn't have a car. Just like that, they, have, they had cars, they had jobs, things like that. So much miracles, healings of various kinds have happened in our ministries. And all that comes from my devotion to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit and to the Father, and my love for humanity has produced all of that. So, what we are out to do in the future and today all comes from that. Dr. Imeri, you're in the process of uh, writing some books. Do you know when they'll be... Um ready um, i i feel that in the next three four months the books will be ready by december we should have three books uh already in the market there are so many topics that i'm working on at the same time while i am also engaged in all these different things that i'm doing in ministry now let me begin to say that we have different shows that we we put out there there is the rejoice and rejoice which is our sunday message there is the Dikai Mary School, Dikai Mary's Ministry School of the Supernatural, which is what actually takes me around the globe. Then there is also a global institute, which also is um, where we train pastors, politicians as leaders, and we train uh, people in the business and investment world. We also have what we call the Dikai Mary's Ministries Charity, where people give excuse me, for us to do charity works around the world. So these are, and then we have the Rich 1000 Plus where I coach and train those who want to be rich on their principles and dynamics of the Bible. The Bible is a book of decision, not just a book of devotion. So I use that principle 
to 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 train them. This these are all the we also have the Dikai Mary's uh, global evangelization and mission. So I I would like people to give towards those and to support me to do those ministries. These are what we are out to do. I also have what I call it the Kai Mary School of the Word, where if you want to learn the Bible, go to the internet, you click my, my channel or you click my, my, uh, my YouTube, and then you will see some of the video that talks about the Kai Mary School of the Word, whereby you can join to learn the School of the Word. Our website is coming up pretty soon, and we will have all those things in place for you. People can go to the Kai Mary's Ministries um, site, and you can you can contribute or donate online and i can assure you of this if you give to our ministry you have become um you place yourself in a situation that god cannot stop blessing you wherever you are in the world it does not matter will we be able to get these books on e Ebook. Yeah, they will be they will be on Apple, Apple Store and on Amazon, Banks and Noble, all those places. The books will be there. Right. Thank you for letting me interview you, Doctor Idika. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and I hope to do this again sometime. Oh, thank, thank you. you thank. Thank you, Lady Beverly. You are so awesome, and uh, I thoroughly enjoy, um, I thoroughly enjoy um, answering uh, your questions, and um, I believe very strongly that it's going to be helpful for people out there to be able to really um, know what the Dikai Mary's Ministries is about and where we are going with it. Thank Th you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.